Business leaders want their privacy and their children's privacy protected, just like everybody else does. Consumer and privacy advocates also want to make sure that America keeps leading the world in technology and innovation and apps. So there are some basic common sense, pragmatic steps that we ought to all be able to support. And rather than being at odds, I think that much of this work actually reinforces each other. The more we do to protect consumer information and privacy, the harder it is for hackers to damage our businesses and hurt our economy. Meanwhile, the more companies strengthen their cybersecurity. The harder it is for hackers to steal consumer information and hurt American families. So we've got to all be working together in the same direction. And I'm confident if we do we'll be making progress. We are the country that invented the internet. And we're also the pioneers of this information age, the creators, the designers, the innovators. Our children are leaving us in the dust, if you haven't noticed. They're connecting and they're collaborating like never before, and imagining a future we can only dream of. When we Americans put our minds together and our shoulder to the wheel, there's nothing we can't do. So I'm confident, if we keep at this, we can deliver the prosperity and security and privacy that all Americans deserve. We pioneered the Internet, but we also pioneered the Bill of Rights. And a sense that each of us as individuals have a sphere of privacy around us that should not be breached.
whether by our government, but also by commercial interests. And since we're pioneers in both these areas, I'm confident that we can be pioneers in crafting the kind of architecture that will allow us to both grow. Innovate, and preserve those values that are so precious to us as Americans. Thank you very much. And thanks to the FTC for all the great work you do to protect the American people. Thank you. Barack Obama. Post-G20 Economic Summit Remarks and Press Conference. Delivered April 2, 2009, Excel Centre, London, England. Good afternoon, or good evening we're running a little bit late. Earlier today, we finished a very productive summit that will be I believe, a turning point in our pursuit of global economic recovery. By any measure, the London summit was historic. It was historic because of the size and the scope of the challenges that we face. and because of the timeliness and magnitude of our response. The challenge is clear. The global economy is contracting. Trade is shrinking. Unemployment. is rising. The international finance system is nearly frozen. Even these facts can't fully capture the crisis that we're confronting. Because behind them is the pain and uncertainty that so many people are facing. We see it back in the United States. We. See it here in London. We see it around the world, 
families losing their homes. Workers losing their jobs and their savings, students who are deferring their dreams. So many have lost so much. Just to underscore this point, back in the United States. Jobless claims released today were the highest in 26 years. We owe it to all of our citizens to act, and to act with a sense of urgency. In an age where our economies are linked more closely than ever before. The whole world has been touched by this devastating downturn. And today, the world's leaders have responded with an unprecedented set of comprehensive and coordinated actions. Now, just keep in mind some historical context. Faced with similar global challenges in the past, the world was slow to act, and people paid an enormous price. That was true in the Great Depression, when nations prolonged and worsened the crisis by turning inward. Waiting for more than a decade to meet the challenge together. Even as recently as the 1980s, the slow global response deepened and widened a debt crisis in Latin America that pushed millions into poverty. Today, we've learned the lessons of history. I know that in the days leading up to the summit, some of you in the press Some commentators confused honest and open debate with irreconcilable differences. But after weeks of preparation, and two days of careful negotiation, We have agreed on a series of unprecedented steps to restore growth and prevent a crisis like this from happening again.
let me outline what I think has been most significant. Number 1, we are committed to growth and job creation. All G20 nations have acted to stimulate demand. Which will total well over $2 trillion in global fiscal expansion. The United States is also partnering with the private sector to clean out the troubled assets. The legacy assets that are crippling some banks, and using the full force of the government to ensure that are. Action leads directly to loans to businesses large and small, as well as individuals who depend on credit. And these efforts will be amplified by our G20 partners, who are pursuing similarly comprehensive programs. And we also agreed on bold action to support developing countries. So that we aren't faced with declining markets that the global economy depends on. Together, the G20 is tripling the IMF's lending capacity and promoting lending by multilateral. Development banks to increase the purchasing power and expand markets in every country. We've also rejected the protectionism that could deepen this crisis. History tells us that turning inward can help turn a downturn into a depression. And this cooperation between the world's leading economies signals our support for open markets. As does our multilateral commitment to trade finance that will grow our exports and create new jobs. That's all on the growth front. And next we made enormous strides in committing ourselves to comprehensive reform of a failed regulatory system. And together, I believe that we must put an end to the bubble and bust economy that has stood.
in the way of sustained growth and enabled abuse of risk-taking that endangers our prosperity. At home, back in the States, our efforts began with the approach that Secretary Gaithner proposed last week. The strongest regulatory reforms any nation has contemplated. So far to prevent the massive failure of responsibility that we have already seen. Today, these principles have informed and enabled the coordinated action that we will take with our G20 partners. To prevent future crises, we agreed to increase transparency and capital protections for financial institutions. We're extending supervision to all systemically important institutions. Markets and products, including hedge funds. will identify jurisdictions that fail to cooperate. Including tax havens, and take action to defend our financial system. We will re-establish the Financial Stability Forum with a stronger mandate. And we will reform and expand the IMF and World Bank so they are more efficient, effective and representative. Finally, we are protecting those who don't always have a voice at the G20. But who have suffered greatly in this crisis. And the United States is ready to lead in this endeavor. In the coming days, I intend to work with Congress to provide $448 million in immediate assistance. To vulnerable populations from Africa to Latin America and to double support for food safety too. Over $1 billion so that we are giving people the tools they need to lift themselves out of poverty.
we will also support the United Nations and World Bank as they coordinate. The rapid assistance necessary to prevent humanitarian catastrophe. I have to say, though, that this is not just charity. These are all future markets for all countries, and future drivers of world economic growth. Let me also underscore my appreciation to Prime Minister Brown, his entire team. And all my colleagues from around the world who contributed to the summit's success. You know, it's hard for 20 heads of state to bridge their differences. We've all got our own national policies, we all have our own assumptions. Our own political cultures. But our citizens are all hurting. They all need us to come together. So I'm pleased that. The G20 has agreed to meet again this fall, because I believe that this is just the beginning. Our problems are not going to be solved in one meeting, they're not going to be solved in two meetings. We're going to have to be proactive in shaping events and persistent in monitoring our progress to determine whether further action is needed. I also want to just make a few remarks about additional meetings I had outside of the G20 context. While here in London I had the opportunity to hold bilateral meetings with leaders of Russia. China, South Korea, Saudi Arabia, and India, as well as Great Britain. And these discussions were extraordinarily valuable and productive. Of course, we spoke about additional steps to promote economic recovery and growth. But we also discussed coordinated actions on a range of issues, how we could reduce the nuclear threat.
How we could forge a coordinated response to North Korea's planned missile launch. How we can turn back terrorism and stabilize Afghanistan, how we can protect our planet from the scourge of climate change. I'm encouraged that we laid the groundwork for real and lasting progress on a host of these issues.